Now we're going to look at how not to make a spring. Let's imagine we want a spring with a spring constant, 200 newton per meter, and about one millimeter deflection, and without breaking, right? You could always deflect a spring as far as you want. You're eventually going to damage it. So we'll say we don't need much, just a millimeter. And we want to use copper wire uh, with copper wire. And you might think, what's the best way to do that? Well, I always, you know, Occam's razor, right? The simplest thing you could possibly do must be the best. So let's imagine just hang a copper wire. We know that uh, metals have the proportional part of the elasticity curve that follows Hooke's law. So why don't we just hang a wire and keep our life simple? So here it is hanging down like that. It's got a length L. Um, it'll have some radius R in there, some cross-sectional area A. And uh, let's just think about what we would have to do to get these properties. What would it have to look like? Well, for the spring constant, we can actually derive it from the definition of uh, the Young's modulus. So we know this thing. We know that we can look up the Young's modulus of copper and it's the stress over the strain, right? So the stress was the force we're eventually going to apply here per unit area of the wire, pi r squared of the wire, um, divided by the strain. That's like how far we're going to stretch it, delta x, over the total length, L. So if we want to think of this as a spring constant, we just need to sort of rewrite this where it's f is some constant times delta x. Right, so I think I can do that, delta x over here, f, and you've got the Young's modulus there, um, pi r squared over L times delta x. So this must be your spring constant that you're going for. And what you see um, when you do this is that you can achieve a spring constant this way by changing r or L. Right? You can have a really long wire to get a low spring constant, or you can have a really thin wire to get a low spring constant, and vice versa. You want a high spring constant, a really short, fat wire will have a high spring constant. Uh, the, the Young's modulus of the copper is an intrinsic property that you can't, can't change. So this doesn't really completely design the spring for us. This, uh, we, we need another parameter. The other parameter, though, that we gave numerically was you got to have a one millimeter deflection without bending. So let's look at that copper curve again. Let's see. So this was strain, and this was stress. And we said metals, it'll go up, and then it'll start something bad will happen. You got the proportional part, and then you'll start to, uh, to stretch the wire. It'll become plastic. So we want to stay in here. So we want to keep our strain where this is going to be sort of one millimeter over L, that point. And you know when that happens in, uh, in, uh, uh, in a material, that's a, that's a property of the material called the tensile strength. So it's up here, the tensile strength. And it happens uh, at about a certain stress, and it happens at about a certain uh, percent elongation. So I looked it up. For, um, for copper, and it's about 200 uh, newtons per millimeter squared. 200 newtons per millimeter squared, right? So we would have to do to figure out, maybe we'll be able to get the length, right? This doesn't depend on the area, it just depends on the length and delta x. So what we could say is um, we want a case where we have our, our formula here, our Young's modulus, equals, let's look at that maximum uh, stress, stress, 200 newtons per millimeter squared, over the delta x we wanted was one millimeter over L. What we're finding out is how long does it have to be to be able to stretch it by a millimeter without hitting 200 newtons per millimeter squared. The Young's modulus we could plug in, it's 11 times 10 to the 10 newton per meter squared. 11 times 10 to the 10 Newton per meter squared. So paying attention that that's millimeters and that's meters, and you turn it all around, and you get that the length 
needs to be 5.5 meters. So to keep from overstretching a piece of copper wire, no matter what its area is, doesn't matter, you've got to, if you're going to stretch it a millimeter, it has to be 5.5 meters. It's getting kind of big. The good news is we have that much room in here. We have this high ceiling. So I've actually hung a wire there, a copper wire, all the way from the top. So you know, it's around five meters, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, right? So we have sort of set that up. So now that we've set L, we can go back and decide what does the radius of the wire need to be. So let's go back and now let's put some numbers in here. Uh, let's see, we wanted this, which is the spring constant, to be about 200. All right, we wanted about 200 uh, newtons per meter, and it's unfortunate that this is the same number. But this is the spring constant I want in newton per meter, and this is the tensile strength in newton per millimeter squared. Those are, those are different. So this has to equal um, the uh, 11 times 10 to the 10th. That's the Young's modulus in newton per meter squared times, uh, I'm just going to put area for now. Let's just solve for the area. Then we'll convert it to the radius of the wire over 5.5 meters. Okay. Solve that for the area, and I got a number that was 10 to the minus 8, approximately, meters squared. So if you want to turn that into a radius of the wire, you get R, set that equal to pi R squared, solve for R, you get 56 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. 56, what we call microns, micrometers. So that's a pretty thin wire that we need, um, but magnet wires are about that thin. So if you know these wires that you, they're in, sort of sealed with resin and you can wind them around to make electromagnetics, magnets, the really thin ones of those are clearly the whole thing's less than a millimeter. So it's in the tenths of millimeter, hundreds of micron range. Um, the one I grabbed is probably a little thicker than 56 microns, but it's very fine magnet wire. So it's the right order of magnitude, we would say. So here it is over here. It's about five meters. It's got sort of a roughly 100 micron uh, diameter, so a roughly 50 micron radius, more or less. And it's hanging all the way down. So the first question is, is it acting like a spring, like it's supposed to? Does it act like a spring? So I put a weight on it so that you could feel and see, is there any springiness to it? And the answer is that there is. I know you can't feel this, but if you just trust me, I can feel it going, if I go down, it pops back up. If I pull it up, it goes back down, of course, because of gravity. Now, it would be very hard to measure that spring constant. We could have a little marker here and add more weight and measure it that way. But another way we could measure it would be uh, to measure the frequency of the oscillation and think of it as a little mass on a spring oscillator and get the spring constant out that way, even though we haven't covered that yet. Maybe you've seen that before. So here I'm going to release it and show you that it does oscillate up and down, sinusoidal motion. So if I were to ballpark that, I would say it's about 5 hertz, 1,000, 2,000, eh, more, maybe a little more. Call it 5 hertz. So let's see what spring constant we get from that. If we say that's at 5 hertz, um, and we know for a mass on a spring, the resonant frequency is the square root of the spring constant over the mass. So 5 hertz, but that's in radians per second times 2 pi, like that, equals the square root of the k that we're solving for and over the mass, so that little mass I hung on there is about, is 220 grams, so 0 0.22, everything is 22 here, uh, K kilograms. That's a Newton per meter, like that. That's in radians per second. So if you square this and turn it around and blah, 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 I forgot my notes. Let me guess, 200, and let's see what you get. Um, Oh yeah, no, you get about 200. K is about 200 Newton per meter if you run all the numbers that way. So you can see we get about the right number. So we designed a spring, right? That's like the worst spring you could possibly uh, come up with because just to get 
a few millimeters of extension, it's got to be five meters long, and you've got to have a mass hanging on it to get it set at the right tension. So this is why we don't make springs this way. Okay? It illustrated some of the physics, but the way you really make a spring, as you know, is like this, with a coil. So a good coil spring doesn't rely on the extension modulus, on the Young's modulus. It relies on a torsional modulus. So torsion is when you take a, a rod and you twist it like this. And the modulus is related to the shear modulus because of the way materials deform. But what you can imagine, the reason springs are shaped the way they are is when you put a tension on the spring, every little loop on the spring goes through torsion. And every one just torch, this is twist just a little bit, maybe you know, 1% of a full rotation where it's still in the uh, proportional range of the material. But that one little percent causes two of the loops to extend by just a little bit. But then there's a lot of loops, right? Every loop gets to extend. Therefore, we can easily double the length of the spring without leaving the proportional and the nice, safe, elastic regime. Whereas over here, we can only move 0.1% or something like that, a fraction of a percent. Here, we can double the length. So if you ever wondered why springs are shaped like this, this is the reason. 